Good evening. Good to see everyone. We are uh, finishing up a brief, and I, I emphasize that, a brief study of the Holy Spirit. We could have done a whole lot more than this, uh, but we've given, hopefully given you some material uh, that will help you as you talk to other people and in your own thinking as well. So tonight we're going to come to the fruit of the Spirit. I have heard a few people, not necessarily here, I don't remember anybody here, uh, but I've heard a few people call, talk about the fruits of the Spirit. That's not biblical. There, there is a fruit of the Spirit. And uh, it's just like any fruit. It has various uh, things that make it up. And I've talked about uh, like an apple has a stem and a core and a, has seeds and has, I call them husks. I don't know what the technical term is. It has the meat, it has the, the uh, peel, all that's different parts uh, of, of the apple, and yet it's just one apple, it's just one fruit. So uh, this is the same way, the fruit of the Spirit. These are various aspects of that. What I want to do tonight is to read uh, from Galatians chapter 5, read all, these, uh, all of this fruit in one uh fell swoop, and then we'll begin to talk about each uh, independent uh, aspect of it. So look, beginning at verse, uh, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So we have the fruit of the Spirit, and it starts with love. I want us to, to instantly recognize that love is God's dominant characteristic. And so you've got 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, uh, where John writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, when we look at, uh, at probably the most famous quote about that, uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, we see that nature uh, set forth uh, pretty plainly uh, when it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, how much love does it take to give up your own son? And then top that with this, how much love does it take to give up your own son for people that are against you? People who are your enemies, uh, not by your choice, by theirs. They chose to be God's enemies, but he but he had his son to die anyway. Now, what is a natural response to the love of God? It is a returned love, if you would. So, John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, it is remarkable to me and a little bit sad how many times that I'll have somebody come in, or two people usually, uh, come in and they'll be they'll have difficulties. It's a married couple, and uh, and they reassure me. I love I love my wife. I love my husband. But then you begin to listen to what they say, and you begin to say, oh, you know what, what what does love mean to you? Uh, one of the most damaging things I ever have seen is a uh, is a woman. It usually is a woman who is abused, she comes to believe that love is abuse. She does not feel loved unless she's beaten, which is bizarre. I mean, that's beyond anything that you and I might think. Here's the real tragedy of it. Beyond that, that's bad enough. The children in that household learn the same thing. They follow that same line, see? So we've got to... We've got to watch. How do you respond to God's love? You do what he says. That's how you respond to it. That's the natural response. So 
Uh, where does this love display itself? Well, look at Matthew chapter 22, for example. Uh, here is uh, Jesus talking about some of these matters. And as he talks about it, Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 36, uh, we find this. Uh, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. Um, I would suggest to you that there's plenty of evidence that shows that if you do not love your fellow man, take the book of 1 John, it'll, it'll elaborate on that. If you do not love your fellow man, you don't really love God. Uh, John points out that man's made in the image of God. And so if you don't love your fellow man, then how could you say you love God? Man has, has that same eternal spirit within him. God is an eternal spirit. Man has an eternal spirit in him. That, that's what we ought to love. And you might say, well, yeah, but I don't like their action. Well, hey, guess what? God loved us. He didn't like our actions either. Uh, I'm going to dare to say, uh, you know, Tim, you've got, like I do, grown children. Did your children ever act occasionally, and I talk about it all the time, in a way that didn't satisfy you? See? Yes. And I, I guarantee I can go around the room, and every parent's going to say the same thing. Did that make you stop loving them? No. It doesn't make you give up love. Uh, sometimes you want to wring their neck, as my mama used to say, but, uh, but, uh, you know, but, but no, you don't give up on them. You still love them. Uh, despite what they do. And we'll talk more about the nature of love in just a minute. Uh, Matthew 5, probably the most familiar of these outside of what we just read, where he says, love your enemies. Uh, and that's why we're going to have to talk about this word love. Uh, because, you know, I think about my enemies, and I think, well, they don't hold the spot Teresa holds. They don't hold the spot that my children hold. Not my enemies. Well, that's not what he's talking about. And we'll see that in, in just a moment. And then, of course, uh, Romans uh, chapter 5 uh, talks about God's love for, guess who? For his enemies. See? He sent his son to die uh, so that we might live. So God demonstrated to us what that was all about. So what love is this? Now, we talked about this in some of my classes. There'll be those of you here that are familiar with it, tolerate just for a moment or two me going over it again so that everybody is familiar with this. I've put all these this time in print. Uh, there are three, with the, well, really, I should have put four. There are three words for love other than the one we're talking about tonight. Uh, the first is eros. It describes a desire one might have for a person or a thing. And that word is never used in the New Testament. Now, my suspicion is that that is what is recorded there in uh, Matthew chapter 14 when for his birthday, Herodias' daughter dances for Herod, and Herod says, I'll give you whatever you want up to the half my kingdom. I suspect that was Eros. I don't know that. When I get to heaven, I've got a good question about that one, if I'm allowed to ask questions. Or if I won't automatically know, which I, I don't know the answer to that either. Uh, but uh, that's Eros. Storge is the way they say that. So the E is a long A actually on the end. Uh, according to Vine is love of kindred, especially of parents for children and children for parents. Now here's the odd thing about Storge love. And that is it is only used twice in the New Testament, and both times it's in the negative. That is, these individuals don't have what you would expect them to have, a love for their own flesh. And I propose to you that if you look at both of those references, especially in Romans, that when a person doesn't have proper love for their own flesh, 
they are a person that's going to be fully and thoroughly involved in wickedness. They don't have love for their own flesh. I guarantee you they're not going to have it for you. I guarantee it. Every time. And so, uh, I, I want to propose to you that you need to look. We all need to look. And I'm, I'm thankful for the ruling of the Supreme Court this year. But, but abortion is a failure to love your own flesh. That's what it is. And we've had literally millions of babies that have been aborted in the United States uh, since 1973. Millions of them. And, you know, this idea of, well, you know, I've got my own reproductive rights. My answer to that is, well, yes, you do. You have the right to do it God's way, which is one man for one woman for life. And, uh, and beyond that, that's the only right you got. Once the child's conceived, you got life in you. And I can demonstrate that biblically several places. But that's not this lesson, so I'm going to go ahead. That's storge, without natural affection. Phileo is basically represents tender affection. Uh, in the book of John, you've got to watch him because John uh, sometimes uses uh, phileo and ag agapao interchangeably. So it may not be quite as easy to distinguish in the book of John. Why did he do that? Well, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I'm just telling you that's the way it is uh, in his writing. And then the last, uh, and the, the, the fourth word for love is agape, and again, the long A where the E is, or agapao. Uh, often it's agapao which is just a form of agape. It's just uh, they use different endings to get you to different places in the way that they speak. But agape is an intellectual commitment to the best interest of the object of its love. Christian love is not an impulse from the feelings. It does not always run with the natural inclinations, nor does it spend itself upon those for whom some affinity is discovered. Love seeks the welfare of all. Of course, this is Vine. He, he quotes or uses Romans 15 too for that. It works no ill to any. Uh, Romans 15, 8 through 10, which says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. What I owe everybody, love. Now, not uh, not the, the love of affection. That's not it. This is a just a commitment to their best interest. Why do we do that? Because God taught us to. That's what he did. And if we're going to be his children, we've got to have the same type of love for everybody, including, interestingly enough, our enemies. Love seeks opportunity to do good to all men, especially toward those or them who are the household of faith. He uses Galatians 6.10 for that. And then, and then references several other places, particularly 1 Corinthians 13, which discusses love in detail, and Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14. So what kind of love is Paul talking about? Galatians 5, he's talking about agapao or agape love. It's an intellectual commitment to the best interests of the other, and that would be everybody. You know, Christians got to be real careful uh, ab about using the idea of I hate those people, whoever those people are. Got to be real careful about that. Uh, because, because God, if we're going to be like God, we can't do that. We got we to love them. He did. Our right, next second word was uh, joy. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, joy is, is produced, for example, by salvation. And so in Acts chapter 8, you've got the, the uh, story of the Ethiopian nobleman. We usually call him the eunuch because he was a eunuch. Not unusual, by the way. Uh, the rulers in that era thought that, that uh, a man who was a eunuch was more trustworthy. Uh, you, you couldn't, uh, Matahari couldn't get to him. Uh, is, is their thinking on that. If you don't know who Matahari is, look it up in your history book, you'll find it. 
<laughs> uh, but, but at any rate, um, so here we've got this eunuch who was working in the, uh, as a, a treasury officer in the uh, kingdom that was ruled by Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He'd gone to Jerusalem to worship. By the way, how much did he love God? Well, that's about, uh, by some estimates, a thousand mile journey in a, in a, what we would call a buckboard wagon. I mean, that, I know it's a chariot, but, but still they, they didn't have, you know, the shock absorbers that you and I think are so important, uh, cause it gives a better ride. They didn't have those. They did have some springs sometimes, but not very often, even that a very rough ride, but he'd gone all the way to, to worship God at Jerusalem. He's on his way back. Having done that, when Philip came to him and asked him, uh, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I accept some man should guide me? Which shows his love for God's genuine. Uh, that is, he, he didn't just go to worship to, as a display, a put on, so everybody would say, oh, isn't he religious? No, this guy really wants to know, what does God want from me? He's really, really a, loves God. Uh, and he learns the truth, and what does he do? He obeys the gospel, he's baptized. When he comes out of the water, Philip is caught away uh, by the Spirit, so the eunuch never sees him again, according to what Luke reports. And he, that is the eunuch, goes on his way rejoicing. Uh, I have, I've been blessed to, uh, to be present for a number of baptisms and, and have gotten to... Uh, to personally, you know, uh, do the baptizing of some people. And it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing to watch their joyful response. If they really understand that they were sinners, that they were lost, that their, their uh, lives were bound for an eternity in the fires of hell, and that now because of their obedience that they're saved, they're, they're, that's joy. That's just pure, pure joy. You see a similar thing, by the way, uh, in Acts 16, where you talk, there you're talking about the uh, Philippian jailer uh, who, who rejoices because, in his obedience as well. Uh, but once we have obeyed the gospel, then our loving obedience uh, is tied to joy. Look at John uh, 15. This is, this is Jesus in the closing week of his life, it's, uh, sometimes, uh, I look at John and think, wow, you know, uh, the best, about half of John is about the last week of the life of Christ. It's just pretty close to that. Uh, Romans, uh, excuse me, John 15, look at verses 10 and 11. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be made full. When are we happiest? Well, when we're doing the things that the one that loves us wants us to do. That's when we're happiest. Uh, by the way, I st in good marriages, I believe that that very characteristic is the source of most fights. Because both people in the marriage want to please the other one. And so they, when they get down to a choice, where do you want to go eat? Well, here it comes, boy. It's going to be a fight for sure because nobody's going to tell where they want to go. They want the other one to decide. Well, then the fight's going to be over. You won't decide. You know, of course, they could say, well, you won't either. And, and they usually do, by the way. Uh, that's, that's how that goes. But... But uh, doing good things for people that you love produces joy. It's, it's, a, it's just a natural. Look at the book of Romans. Of course, Romans 10 is talking about the uh, dissemination of the gospel uh, under the direction of Jesus Christ and God the Father, for that matter. Uh, but in, in Romans uh, chapter 10, uh, verse 14, we, we hear... How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Uh, preacher, what's a preacher? Good news teller. Not a guy that's paid to do the job. Now, 
He might be paid to do the job, but he doesn't have to be. All of us ought to be good news tellers. And what, what does good news produce in people? Joy. You don't believe that? You probably should go back and see if you can find a, a recording of the Tennessee-Alabama game from Saturday. Uh, those folks had lost 15 straight times. Uh, to Alabama, and uh, they they were celebrating. That, some of them are still celebrating today, you know, because because they won that game, you know. Uh, so, does good news produce joy? It does it does in in our normal daily lives? It does in, in as well in uh, in our Christian life. I just used a few examples from Philippians. If you go to Philippians, you're going to see the word joy and rejoice over and over again. That's the dominant word in the book of Philippians. First Peter, we noted Sunday, the dominant word is what? Anybody remember? Yes, grace is the dominant word in, in First Peter. And that's kind of how you can pick up on uh, what am I going to find in this book? Uh, Peter's pointing you to the grace of God that's going to save you, is what he's talking about. Uh, in, in Philippians, Paul's talking about the happiness, the joy, the rejoicing that comes from being saved, from being in Christ. So they, they have some kinship there, if you think about it. Uh, quite interesting. And then Romans 5 talks about what? Well, in our salvation, uh, we are... we. We become uh, set apart for God's service. Uh, we leave that, uh, that awful place where we once were. A peace. Uh, Christians should have inward peace. I really want to look first at uh, Philippians 4. I know it's the second on the list. Uh, but there the Apostle Paul says, uh, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. By the way, later translations don't use the word keep, they use the word guard, because that's really what the word means in this spot. Keep means that. If you think about it, it can mean that. Um, But notice, this is an inward peace. This peace is not controlled or dictated by external circumstances. In other words, Christians can be in the middle of chaos and still be joyful, still, still be, and still have peace. The peace, and that's why Paul says, it passes understanding. It's, humans don't understand. How, how can you be so at peace when your life is in such shambles? Well, because I have the peace of God. That's, that is why. Now look at 1 John chapter 5, uh, where the, John's writing to his little children in the faith. And as he does that, uh, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, uh, he writes, and let me pick that up so I can read it exactly. 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. We've already talked about the joy that comes with victory. Uh, We, through God's love, overcome the world. Everybody stay tuned. Because uh, Sunday morning, I'm going to be talking about uh, four imperatives as we deal with the world. And an imperative is just a command, okay? It's just a, it's a fancy way of saying command. And, I, you know, my parents paid a lot of money for me to learn to say that word. So I, I use it every now and then, you know. But, but it just means command. That's all it means. And we're going to look at four commands from Paul uh, about, about that. And, and where it points us is just right here, to victory, to victory, don't let, and we're going to talk about that Sunday, don't let somebody rob you of your victory. Look at Isaiah chapter uh, 26, the great messianic prophet. 
who we learned this past Sunday, did not really know uh, about whom he was writing. He wrote some beautiful things about Jesus Christ, but he didn't know who it was. He didn't know when it would happen, uh, nor really how it would happen for the most part. But verse 3 of Isaiah 26 says, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Okay, uh, living example, a fellow by the name of Peter. How long was it good when he got out of the boat and walked on the water? As long as his focus was on Jesus. That's how long it was good. As long as it was there, he had peace. As soon as he took the focus off of Jesus, all of a sudden he sees the turmoil. Now, I want you to think about that in terms of our world today and in relation to Christians. If we don't quit looking at the world so much, we're not going to be a happy people or a peaceful people. We've got to learn to ignore the world. I have advised some people, quit watching the news. It's not helping you. You don't know what to do with it. It's burdening you. Get rid of it. Because you, as Jesus would say, uh, have overcome the world. You've over, and that's, that ought to give us peace. Uh, so then Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we, we didn't read that a little while ago. Uh, instead, we'll come back to it now. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, the Apostle Paul is talking about... <clears throat> Uh, the difference, in some ways, uh, that Christ makes in the life of a Christian. And listen to what he says there. If I can never get the page to turn. Uh, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no peace better than peace with God. What keeps us from being at peace with God? If we do not have peace with God... What is it that stops us from having it? Lack of faith. I don't, won't deny that totally, but I'm look, let's go, go simpler. Go even simpler. Most of the time when I ask a question in class, I'm looking for the really simple element. It's called sin. Okay? That's what, that's what does it. So, you get Isaiah, this, uh, that we just looked at a few moments ago. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, he says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that he cannot save, neither is his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. So, who's responsible for God not listening to me? Me. <laughs> Just me. I can't blame it on anybody else. Uh, our, the world in which we live likes to do that, but, but I can't do that. Uh, I, we can have peace with God if we, uh, if we live His way. Now, one more. John chapter 14. Of course, this is a great... This chapter begins uh, with Jesus talking about how He's going to go and prepare a place for us, that ought to give us a certain amount of peace. But notice that in verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He's leaving his peace. What is the peace of Jesus based upon? Well, I can tell you what it's not based upon. It's not based upon things. If you look at the Sermon on the Mount and you go to the last part of chapter 6, he's going to talk, he's going to talk about that. And, and he said, basically, there are, only, there are only two things that we've got to have. Uh, they wouldn't have been the first two I'd have named, but, that, but they're, they're correct you know, by, by the Lord's standard, and that is food and, and clothing. He doesn't even use the word shelter. We think you've got to have shelter. You know, in order to have peace, in order to have a, have a, a quiet life. No, no. 
Don't have to. Got to have food and clothing. But that's it. That's it. Uh, where should your focus be? Well, he tells it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, what, food and clothing? You're going to have it. The uh, singer of Israel actually says that in his whole lifetime he'd never seen the seed of God begging bread. Isn't that interesting? Okay, peace. Next word, long-suffering. Uh, if you want to substitute this word, you'd call it long-tempered. <laughs> How long will they put up with you <laughs> is the idea. How long will I put up with somebody else? Well, if I've got the fruit of the Spirit in me, I'll be long-suffering. For uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, tells us about the long-suffering nature of God. Why has Jesus not come back yet? And here's my first question to, to, to go, really go along with that. That is, is there no sin in the world? Well, that's pretty easy. There's a lot of sin in the world. So why hadn't he come back yet? There's a lot of wickedness around us, a lot of meanness, a lot of evil. Why hadn't he come back yet? Peter tells us, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. In other words, he, he hadn't forgotten his promise, and nor is he going to fail to carry it out. Well, what promise are we talking about? The second coming, read the whole chapter. Start at verse 1 of uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, so, not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slightness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If either you or I tonight can honestly say, I've got something I don't want to deal with before I die, or before the world comes to an end, then based upon that verse and the unexpected nature of the second coming of Christ, I'd say don't wait another night. Deal with it now. Because the only, you, you're kind of living on borrowed time. You know, he, he's waiting so you have a chance to repent. Make it right. That's what he's waiting for. We need to move in that direction. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh 13 verse 4 lets us know that we need to be like God in some aspects. Uh, in fact, really in all aspects. So listen to what he says there in regard to love. He says, love suffers long. That's long suffering. Just flip it, right? That's all that is. Love suffers long. Long suffering. How long, will you, how long, you know, how long will Teresa put up with the, with the way I do some things. Well, so far, she's at uh, past year 49. <laughs> so far. <laughs> and, uh, and as far as I know, she's not going to quit. You know, she's going to hang in there. Uh, and, you know, I, I would flip it, but there, there's not much you have to suffer with with Teresa. She just, she's just too sweet. But, uh, <clears throat> but that's, that's what we got to do. If we love somebody... If we're going to we're going to be long tempered with them, we're not going to lose our temper uh, quickly with them. Now, does that teach us a lesson? Is there something to be found there for us? And I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, every now and then, I get a phone call. I had one a few weeks ago from a preacher, and some of you've been around the office area. You know, I get these calls all the time now, uh, and. This fellow, well, I, do you have a few minutes I need to talk to you? Yeah, I, what you need? And he says, well, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I love working here, but, it, but when are these people going to get it? You know, when, when are they going when, when to make a chat? I said, brother, because this happened to be one of my old students. I said, you remember what I used to say in, in your classes? Churches are like babies. They grow slowly. You know, babies aren't born eating steak. You ever notice that? They don't, they're not born eating steak. Uh, they're, they're born, you, first thing the doctor wants them to have is milk. And then he says cereal. Have you looked at that cereal? It don't even look like cereal. You know, it's, it's, but, but they go to that. And then the next thing, maybe they get some, uh, some vegetables. But the, other than the color, they don't look like vegetables either. And then they say, well, you can have some meat. Have you looked at that meat? 
I mean, is that meat? Uh, that's not what I want. You know, give me a good piece of steak or something like that. That's meat. But not what the baby eats. But they come along slowly. Guess what? Churches and Christians grow like babies. You think about it. When you're a new Christian, what are you? You're a baby in Christ. And so you get Peter talking about as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word. You and I, and I mean that, you and I need to learn to have long tempers with the brethren. They're going to do things that I don't like. And guess what? I'm probably going to do things they don't like either. Right? So we need to learn to be long-suffering. Uh, Paul put it this way in Ephesians 4.12, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to have a walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering. Now watch how he applies that. Bearing with one another in love. We got, to, we got to put up with each other. Uh, and it's going to be that way. It is each other. It's not me putting up with you only. It works both ways, see. So long suffering. Next one's kindness. Uh, defined as a sweetness of demeanor, which causes one to be a ready servant of others. Now, let's use uh, one quick example because I'm burning too much time, but... Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Uh, tenderhearted is, is, I recall, is splanchnizomai. And uh, you don't need to remember that, uh, but, but you do need to remember what it means. It means move to the bowels. And you might think, that's not a very nice thing to say. Uh, but but see they they didn't they said that that lo the seat of love was in in your stomach region, not your heart. We talk about she's captured my heart. See, but but let me ask you something, fellas. When you met the woman of your dreams, did you feel it here or did you feel it here? Well, I felt it here. Butterflies in your stomach, uh, you know, uh, almost can almost get sick. You know, worry is she going? Is she going to like me? That kind of thing. So, you know, I've told a few people, maybe even you all. I'm waiting for Willie Nelson's new song. Uh, She's captured my bowels. <laughs> you know, because that's that's really the Greek way of looking at it. We need to have kindness toward. One another. Jesus showed it, John 13. That's where he uh, washes their feet. Uh, by the way, kindness is listed as one of the essential virtues that we have to have if we never want to stumble. That's 2 Peter chapter 1. The next word is goodness. Uh, Romans 15, 14 says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. What does goodness make us do? Well, Galatians 6.10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. If we're going to be uh, exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, we've got to be good toward people, especially God's people. But notice, it says especially. Is it, can, do Christians demonstrate goodness toward non-Christians? Well, they ought to. See, and that's been a battleground. Uh, there are brethren that say you can't take one nickel out of the church treasury and help someone that's a non-believer. That's not biblical. That won't hold water. Uh, uh, there's a if you're if you're interested just to study that, you might want to read uh, Thomas B. Warren's book. Uh, which is uh, lectures on church cooperation and orphans' homes, in which he sets forth a, an argument that's called the constituent element argument. And all that means is, he says, 
everything, if, you know, if all the elements are good and true, then the thing is true and good. And that's how he, how he demonstrated we ought to help orphans, we ought to help widows, and so forth. You know, out of the church treasury. Um, because all Christians have the obligation to do those things. Okay, goodness. Faithfulness. Uh, faithfulness is diligently seeking to please God, Hebrews eleven six. You know, you read about uh, Enoch, and, and, uh, or sometimes we'll say Enoch. Uh, Enoch w- was a, a man of faith. God took him home with him, but, but we might ask, well, where's his action word? Well, his action word is in the sixth verse, which comes right after telling about him. Uh, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Well, that's what most people think faith is. And he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So it goes together. You got to, you, yes, you got to intellectually accept that God is, that he exists. But if you do that, then you're going to diligently seek him. And that, that is the sign of faithfulness. Now, faithfulness required for a lifetime. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 10, 22, and also Luke 9, 62. Uh, faithfulness involved, guess what? Telling others the gospel. In the book of 2 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, the apostle Paul says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to, watch it, faithful men who will be able to teach others also. If I don't tell other people the gospel, I'm not faithful by definition. Very important to remember that. Always worries me when Andy gets in here early. Okay, but we got three minutes, so we're going to finish. Okay, so here we go. Gentleness is the next one. Uh, It's the same word basically uh, as meek. In uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 5, it is associated with lowliness. They basically go hand in hand. It's demonstrated in a quiet spirit. Then we've got self-control. Some translations have temperance, uh, but self-control is the idea. You've got to be self-controlled if you want to go to heaven. You can't, you can't constantly be out of control and hope to go to heaven. And I've given you some verses to look at there. And so finally, here's what I want to say, and this comes from H. Leo Bowles in his book on the Holy Spirit. All faithful Christians bear the same kind of fruit. Hence, all Christians are like Christ. Some church members are such driveling believers that they do not let the Holy Spirit produce fruit in their lives. Christians may quench the Holy Spirit. By the way, that's Second Thess- first, excuse me, First Thessalonians 5.19. And we are warned against such. How are we going to keep from quenching the Spirit? Work to have this fruit in its entirety. To have every bit of it. If we want to be what we need to be. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to talk about the rapture and the tribulation. I don't imagine any of you have ever heard those two words. But no, I'm, I'm joking. But we'll talk about that next week. Thank you.